Okay, uh, thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me to give a speech about my projects. Actually, it's uh, not really my dissertation project, but it comes, it originated uh, after our experience in Cyanet. So it's, I think it's really interesting because uh, it's organically growing, <laughs> our project of Cyanet, because we are trying to look in neighborhood from a really different perspective uh, that I have before. So that's why I think uh, this topic is, is really uh, new and interesting also for me. And uh, I also, uh, thanks to the audience, and I also want to uh, 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 please give me uh, many feedbacks because I, I want to also grow in, grow, uh, to, 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 to nurture the this topic to uh, I don't know to hopefully to the an, uh, an article or something of, of book chapter or something like that. So that's why uh, uh, right now I will uh, present the this topic about the Indonesian nationalism and the battle of Surabaya. What the nation means to the Kampung people. And uh, today is really a uh, very uh, interesting day and is uh, uh, really timely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it's a good opportunity to having uh, a speech in the day of the Battle of Surabaya is commemorated in Indonesia nationally. And uh, uh, it's uh, after 1957, it become a national day or even a, a heroes day. People in Indonesia uh, remember the, the, the Battle of Surabaya as the National Heroes Day or Hari Pahlawan. So actually, the Battle of Surabaya. This is the very iconic <laughs> picture of uh, Bung Tomo, a figure, a very uh, a famous figure on that battle. But yeah, it's uh, this picture is not taken uh, on that period because you know it's not in the 1945. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, the, the the picture is photographer after the event. And his slogan is very famous, Merdeka atau Mati, the freedom or die. So it's uh, very popular during that period. The Battle of Surabaya actually was fought between a regular infantry and militia of the Indonesian nationalists against the British troops and with the Dutch uh, uh, to prevent in the Indonesian side to prevent the colonial uh, rules for imposition to the Indonesia because uh, people in Indonesia believe the independence of Indonesia was in the 17th of August 1945. So that's why they felt, they felt responsible to protect or to defend the independence. The peak of the battle was in, in November 1945 and uh, the 10th of November is the beginning of the 20 days of the battle. And the, the battle become a national symbol of Indonesian resistance. So that's why it's uh, now commemorated as a national hero still, Hari Pahlawan. The iconic figure from that time, yeah, this is Bung Tomo, Sutomo, the first Sutomo, because in my uh, talk, I will also uh, uh, touching another Sutomo <laughs> and discussing another Sutomo. We, we say Sutomo, but he, he uh, famously called Bung Tomo. He's a journalist and a leader of militia called Parisan Pemberontak Republic Indonesia, or the, the, the revolt uh, troops of Indonesian Republic. He played an indisp indispensable role in that battle by spreading the revolutionary spirit with his occupations. Through his speech and inflammatory words, he mobilized youth, religious scholars and students, even beca drivers or pedicab drivers and other ordinary common people and masses from all over Java to head for Surabaya's battlefield. And uh, if we take a closer look to his speech, it's very famous speech right now. And even if you are if you are visiting Surabaya and you have opportunity to visit the the museum in the 10 November museum, you can listen to to his recorded voice. Uh, he asks that uh, for to all over Indonesian nationalist movement, he, he even to the youth, especially to the youth. He said that we have also that the Indonesian people in Surabaya who are young people of Maluku 
of Sulawesi, of Bali, of Kalimantan, and from all over Sumatra, Aceh Yot, Tapanuli Yot, and all Indonesian Yot in Surabaya. He asks all the Indonesian by addressing the Yot of Indonesia by addressing by where he where they come from. So it's really interesting uh, 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 to see that the, the after the British forces and the, the Dutch captured Surabaya and the Dutch regained its control over the city, many hinterland many hinterland people, I mean outside of Surabaya, refused to supply Surabaya with items. Then, uh, therefore, I believe that this battle was not merely unrest, a riot, or turmoil caused by the mob because it's like a structurally because uh, people outside of Surabaya also feel that they become uh, or they have already an Indonesian as their nationality, and uh, uh, even they, uh, they 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 will serve the nation with uh, with their life. Uh, and yeah, it came from Indonesia, so that's why I believe that. However, this is my uh, my, my big question. Uh, how did the Indonesian national consciousness emerge in the Kampung people of Surabaya? And uh, what did the nations mean to them? Uh, if we uh, read many references, sources uh, during that period, we know that the adult native people's literacy rate in Surabaya in the in the decade before this event, I mean, in the 1930s to 1940s, was very deficient or lack of uh, literacy rate. So I think it's important. How can if it's really uh, uh, nationalism can imagine by the printing press as adequate by uh, many scholars, like Ben Anderson. So how 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 the process is going? Be? And uh, for this talk. Uh, I will divide it into three parts. The first part is uh, a concept of nationalism from below, and I also talk not only the concept, not only the, uh, the, the, the definition, but also its limitation for me. And the second part of my talk, which address the Surabaya and the nationalist activisms. And the third one, yeah, so the, the core part of this talk, what Bangsa Indonesia means to the Kampung people. And I will go to uh, for the, the next slide. To situate the origins of nations further back in time, nationalism scholars, especially the so-called modernist perspective, fundamentally retain the elite perspective. By finding traces of pre-modernization growth among the literate upper classes, I mean the literate upper classes, middle and up, they infer the existence of national identities among broader sections of the populace. Because in this approach, the masses supposedly fall in step with the nation builders' agenda. So it's kind of a passive. <laughs> right? And the study of their ex their actual national feelings become unnecessary for this view, I mean, for the modern uh, perspective of uh, nationalism study. And then my critic concern narrow, this narrow top-down interpretation of this paradigm. They might, I mean, the people might simply accept elite construction. They might transform appropriate or even infer them, or they might exchange them for their own notions of the nation. I think we should abandon the assumptions that the nation's elite imagination, if the nation, uh, if the nation is imagination, automatically trickle down. It's like a trickle down effect to the people. The top down approach to national identity should be complemented, I believe, with a form below perspective. If one is to understand the complex dynamics of the nationalism, nationalization of the masses. Yeah, we talk about more than only the elite. And then, uh, so uh, the limitation, I also uh, really uh, aware of that. Uh, how was actually the nation experience from below? How can we do that, the methods? And of, of course, uh, as uh, uh, trained historians, the sources is really uh, indispensable, <laughs> uh, uh, indispensable uh, materials for, for reconstruct the history even from below. Even it, if we want to look at the below, where is the below is? <laughs> and also, 
yeah imply that we limit our attention to ordinary people and if so who are the ordinary one and as john bruley the, the 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 professor of nationalism also nationalism studies also remind in the 2012 the first and most obvious requirement of any project to study popular nationalism or nationalism from Bruley is an empirical one so that's why uh, i think uh, the historical approach is really uh, 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 a really matter to find the, uh, the erudite one, the, the, the sources. I mean, uh, not only the the the, uh, uh, the the printing, but also the oral sources in the kampung. So yeah, that's uh, what I believe with it. And therefore, I try to categorize nationalism from below uh, in my in this period in the 1920s to 1940s or at the end of 40s. With this kind of pyramid at the top there is a level that i uh, yeah i, I called uh, indonesian nationalism which was promoted by nationalist leaders outside of surabaya this elite yeah like sukarno and hatta i defined by the figure whose ideas dominated the discourse of indonesian nationalism at the end of the 20s to the indonesia and independence day and the revolution or persia period so it's so Karno even he grew up in Surabaya, but in the 20s, he, his activism uh, was not in Surabaya. And in the middle of this pyramid of this structure, the Surabayan elite, I mean Indonesian Surabaya elite nationalists, by defined by the figure who actively promoted Indonesian nationalism at the local level, I mean in the Surabaya level. However, I admit that several figures could not fit into one category. Now, this one I want to... Um, uh, to discuss another figure, another Sutomo he is uh, Dr. Sutomo. He is a doctor in arts, uh, in this arts. But he is arts, yeah, in in, in Surabaya, not uh, not uh, only in this arts. He was very active at the local level and tried to unify the Indonesian nationalist organization, not only in Surabaya but in all over area of Indonesia. And yeah, then I argue that the people like Dr. Sutomo contributed heavily to the intensive exchanging ideas, the circulating ideas between the national levels leader, I mean the national outside of Surabaya and Kampung people in Surabaya that period. So uh, I, I don't want to talk about the national level because there's no national at the time. <laughs> Even uh, some uh, some we will argue that Batavia, but Sukarno is not in Batavia at the time. And this one uh, here is uh, uh, the second part of my my talk. Yeah, the uh, in this uh, left of uh, the, uh, the, the there is a picture of uh, Haji Umar Said uh, Chokro Aminoto, the uncrowned king of Java, and Khron Konain Pan Java who is very active. Uh, yeah, even Sarikat Islam want to create a national level organization, even the big masses, but actually he live in Kampung, particularly in Kampung Penele, and then he moved to the neighbor Kampung of Penele called Kampung Plantikan. But yeah, he, uh, yeah, it's kind of Sutomo before uh, in his uh, in his peak of his career in the Sarikat Islam in Surabaya in the 1912 and the 1920. But in the, the, the right set of uh, him, there is a Dr. Sutomo, which is uh, established the Indonesian Study Club, or the Indonesia Study Club. The Indonesian Study Club was the first of the study clubs that sprung up in Yafas major cities between 1924 and 1926. Uh, I mean, after the Al Khamenei Study Club, the General Study Club in Bandung, uh, founded by Sukarno. Sutomo was the major intellectual influence in the Indonesian Study Club. He shared the worldview of the new Western educated intellectual class that emerged in Indonesia in growing number from the 1910s. Yeah. So uh, the pioneer was the Chokro Aminoto, then it can it's like a continuation of, of, of him. The seeds is already there, then uh, and then uh, Sutomo just uh, continue to growing. <laughs> the Indonesian Study Club assumed a significant educational role. Regular lectures, courses were organized, including literacy courses for Surabaya workers, 
a substantial lending library was created and at the beginning of 1926 it started its own monthly publication called Suluh Indonesia the torch of Indonesia and and the next slide uh, we have the yeah this is the the emblem of the Indonesian study club uh, I'm sorry uh, actually uh, I I don't uh, put the, the the color one but actually it's uh, because yeah uh, i have the the, the image but uh, I, I don't bring it <laughs> in the netherlands <laughs> so maybe if i have an opportunity in the near future i will go back to indonesia and try to picture the 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 the, the, uh, the color one of this emblem the emblem of indonesia static club for me it's very interesting because it's consistent one hand holding a sickle and a rice plant and the other holding a pen <laughs> So it symbolized the masses and the intellectuals working hand in hand with each other and the responsibility of the educator towards workers and peasants. And actually is the, the colors uh, were not black and white, but red and green. Red was the color of nationalism and green the color of Islam. This symbolized an organization that committed to the idea of Indonesia and open to all people irrespective of political or religious conviction, even the green is Islam, but it's not like uh, Muhammadiyah or Nahdlatul Ulama, who's, or even Sarikat Islam. Uh, members of this club were free to join political parties of their choice. So it's really uh, uh, interesting to see the people. And this is one from uh, their uh, pu publication. Uh, this is uh, 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 one of the invitations, yes, Tomo and his club actually uh, often receive an invitation from many places in Java. So that's why the, uh, his idea and yeah, his circle idea is also a spreading, not only in Surabaya. This is from the Sur of Indonesia, Torch of Indonesia. One of an invitation from the branch of Sarikat Islam party at Madiun. And there was very interesting one, the Javanese Nationalist Club. So there, there, there was in 1926, there is still a, a club or the organization that aspire the Javanese nationalism. It's in Madion of East Java. Yeah, but uh, at that uh, event, Sutomo actually actively promoted the Indonesian nationalism instead of Javanese nationalism. According to him, the Javanese should contribute more toward the Indonesian nation and work together with other people from all over archipelago to achieve Indonesia Merdeka, the independence and, and of Indonesia, and another term, the Indonesia Mulia. This concept is uh, interesting, or the a glorious Indonesia. Indonesia Mulia. Yeah, the concept is promoted by Sutomo. And later, after the term Indonesia independence banned by the colonial government, this term is really uh, circulated everywhere. Uh, okay, and then I move to other, the next slide. And uh, the other uh, activities uh, actually is uh, PPKI, Perhimpunan Permufakatan Persatuan Kebangsaan Indonesia, or the Federation for the Nas Indonesian Nationalist Organization. It's actually formed by Sukarno in 1926. Uh, seven to unite the existing political parties. Yeah, according to Sukarno, uh, the, 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 the format, the, the, uh, the founder, the PKI was a federation that reflected the social and political situation in Indonesia, where a variety of organizational orientation were present. The federation had a loose structure and formed a Sao Matang Front. There is not a front not only from Pembela Islam like today, but also from Sao Matang. Sao Matang is the, the color skin, the skin color of the, the indigenous, the native Indonesia. Consisting of the native Indonesian who traditionally had dark brown skin and were ready for the intense fight with the white front of the government, the European community. This also, uh, 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 actually, uh, this is the, 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 the first congress of the PPKI uh, held by the Indonesian Study Club at Surabaya. Even it's uh, the founder uh, is Sukarno, but the the, the, the first congress uh, held in Surabaya and in the in in the in the cantor of the, uh, the the Indonesian Study Club. There are many people come there, and even if we uh, take a closer look to the the news in Indonesia, uh, we can see that we can read that there is a full people coming flocking the the study club kebau the, the the building of indonesia study club when the 
Congress was held. And very interesting to see is uh, they also, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, serve very interesting uh, dinner, the welcoming dinner, the menu. They, they have a very special menu like uh, uh, to represent, yeah, it's provided by all the participants and uh, represent uh, how various uh, in the nationalist uh, organization that participate in the Congress. There is Soto from Sarekat Madura, from Madura Island. There is a sate kambing, the, the, the mutton sate, and sambal goreng, ayam goreng, primores, gado-gado, even frikadel. Budi Utom also participate by the frikadel. It's, it's now coming uh, uh, like in Indonesian, authentic Indonesian food. So you, you, you can see this very interesting how they try to depict the, the, the variety uh, of the Indonesian nationalists and and uh, represent them into the, the, the food. <laughs> and yeah, uh, and another activities of the Indonesian Study Club is also, uh, uh, I think it's interesting to see is when they want to build a Kedum National Indonesia of the Indonesian Nationalist uh, Building. They found a stifting or a foundation. And actually, according to Sutomo, uh, this building inspired by the Polish National Museum at Switzerland, who, who uh, founded by the Polish diaspora. And up until now, there is a museum there. And in the board of directors, this is the interesting thing. There are many of Indonesia's study clubs leaders, like Sutomo, uh, and Raden Mas Haryo Suyono. Suyono is the son of the Mangkunegoro the Six. So it's not surprising, but for me, it's, uh, uh, if we take a closer look, the commission that is really su surprising because uh, the name is Ahmad Jais. Actually, if we know, Ahmad Jais or Ahmad Jais was not included. We cannot include him as an elite during that period. Uh, he lived in Kampung Penele and if we, we know who is him. We can have the, 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 the next slide is his advertency, the advertisement <laughs> in the newspaper. Ahmad Jais was a tailor. So uh, uh, not really, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, actually he's famous, but not really, I mean, it's it's tailor. It's really, he is not uh, got a Western educated, uh, not, uh, not got a Western education or modern education, uh, uh, yeah. He he was a common people, and yeah, he is a tailor. <laughs> For me, it's interesting, and yeah, I think many researchers already, uh, such as uh, William Bill Frederick, uh, Bob Elson, have been studied Tomo and his activities uh, intensively in the Indonesia Study Club. And recently, there is another work by Yannick Lekek, which which closely examines Tomo and his activities, even with the fascism. I'm really interesting with this. Uh, uh, the, his studies, even the latter, the, the, the study of Alenke, got the IAS National Master Thesis Prize in ASEAN Studies uh, 2008. However, when I uh, read his uh, his article, uh, uh, while the author convincingly elucidated the fascist influence in the doctor's Tom activities in Surabaya in the 1930s, some of his argument, uh, I believe, should be scrutinized. As an example, uh, Lenke wrote this in the article that Sutomo officially called for the transformation of Surya Wirawan into a militaristic youth organization model on the example of the Scout Group National Youth Strong established by the Dutch National Socialist Party or the, the, the fascist. But if we read the Sutomo diary, this is an excerpt from Sutomo's note on the travel to the Netherlands. And clearly, Sutomo's, Dr. Sutomo's aim to establish youth troops Surya Wirawan was not inspired by the National Youth Strong of the National Socialist Party or NSP in the, in the Dutch, but the Arbeid Youth Central of the Social Democrat Workers Party or SDAP, SDEP. And in Surabaya, the Indonesian nation, which Kampung people means, also indicated that they don't aspire a kind of fascist nation, as I will explain in the next part. So this is the core of, uh, I mean, I'm attacked, but I, I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, this is the third one. From the late 19th to the early 20th century, Surabaya rose into prominence as the center of commerce and industry in the Dutch colony of the Netherlands in this. 
the opening of the Suez Canal in the 1899 and the introduction of colonial um, liberal policy in the 1870s accelerated the waves of European capital enterprises, institution, technology, and migrants, which doubled the number of European residents in Surabaya from uh, 4,500 uh, 4, somethings in 1870s to more than 10,000 in 1890s in uh, 1890 yeah by 1930s the population of surabaya had increased to uh, 341,000 making the city as the second highest populated area after batavia as the center of the dutch colonial administration which had a total population more than you know, 500,000 the natives constituted the ma majority or uh, almost 80 percent of the city's population followed by the chinese and foreign orientals and europeans with the more 25,000 people or more than seven uh, almost eight percent of the total population the europeans not only Dutch but also the british and the armenians this photo was taken uh, in front of some shops not owned by the european or the foreign orientals chinese or arab but the natives who live in Kampung. Yeah, it's in the near uh, Kampung Penela. You see the salon, <laughs> the barber shop, and also clear maker, the, the tailor. <laughs> so it's like Ahmad Jais, who is served as a commissioner in the foundation of Gedung Nasional Indonesia. And I move here. And by looking uh, for me, the methods to, to know what did the Indonesian nation means, I want to looking at the newspaper, magazine, and journal which published in several kampung in Surabaya. And also I tried to, to, to dig the memory uh, of the people who is in kampung, how they know the issues, and uh, even they remember the event uh, the, uh, uh, on this period. Even uh, it's very uh, fake, but I think it's really interesting to see that, uh, uh, yeah, I want to investigate how the idea of Indonesian nationalism circulated in and around the kampung and what it means for them. At least I have two, seven of the uh, magazine, the public, publication published in the Kampung People during the 1925 until 1942. Uh, even though the adult native people's literacy rate in Surabaya was meager, yeah, as I had already told you before, the Kampung People follow the current issues from many publications by listening to a literate person who regularly read loud newspaper to them. And this practice uh, still uh, really uh, uh, still still continuing uh, up until the 1990s, and many uh, older people still remember uh, that this practice is really uh, 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 really become a very important source for them to to know the or to follow the news and to follow the current issues and also uh, uh, even questions uh, what the role of them. If, if uh, based on my my interviews in uh, in Kampung Penele and its surrounding, and now this is uh, the first one. This is the map, and uh, I look it. Uh, I, I try to look it uh, which Kampung in it. There is the one. Uh, it is in the Kampung Ketandan near the Jalan Tunjungan. The number six and number seven is in the Kampung Kelampitan and Kampung Penele, which is uh, very closely related, and the, the north of uh, the circle, the number three, is in the, in the Jalan Sulung, Kampung Sulung. Uh, and then uh, four and five is in the Kampung Kedung Klinter. Yes, uh, all the newspaper and the magazine here is from Kampung people. This is the first one, uh, Prasaan Kita, or Our Feeling. <laughs> it's temporarily published once in 10 days by the... By the uh, organization called Persatuan Rakyat Indonesia Sejati or the true United Indonesian people in Surabaya. Consisted public news which voices in the kaum kromo or proletar aspiration. The editor and publisher yeah, is same I live in Kampung Ketandan. And this is one of uh, the news that the editorial notes from this newspaper on the issues was about how the people should love their nation and country. According to the editor, the people can love their nation by following the example of their ancestor, 
such as Bambang Palasar. Bambang Palasar is one of the figure in the Javanese wayang story. <laughs> they could also learn from many developments in agriculture and civilization from other nations. And this is interesting uh, to me to know how uh, the Japanese and Indonesian nation is really uh, 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 reciprocal or even appropriate with one another. The editor believes that the Indonesian people that days feel not only limit, limited as a Japanese because they have a they had already received many lessons from other nation from lain bangsa bangsa is nation yeah but the term of bangsa sometimes uh, not only used for translated the nations but also translated the people people also means bangsa so it's like a folk and nations here i mean in the in the in the in the uh, germanic tradition and the dutch traditions uh, and this is one of the uh, uh, the perasaan kita and yeah this is uh, another uh, 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 title of the news from uh, the, the, the same newspaper, the secondary school, Mulun, the National Secondary School at Bandung, who founded by Sukarno and Sosro Kartono, the brother of mm, uh, Kartini, very famous Kartini. It's uh, refused an incentive to subsidy from the government. And uh, the, the editor believe, uh, I mean, that the journalist of the, the writer of this news believe that their actions should be followed by other true nationalists everywhere, including in Surabaya. Now we are going to the next, uh, the, the, the Suluh Rakyat Indonesia, the another newspaper. Yeah, this Torch of the Indonesian People, actually it is the continuation of the Torch of Indonesia and the Suluh Rakyat. Uh, Sulu Indonesia, I mean the, the Indonesia, the, the, the Sulu Indonesia, the source of Indonesia. It's published once every weekend, affiliated, yeah, this um, affiliated with the Persatuan Bangsa Indonesia, the Association of Indonesian Nation, the political party of the Indonesia Study Club. So it's, yeah, it's kind of elite, but if we take a closer look, the editor and the publisher is not, uh, not really uh, elite. <laughs> I mean, it's also in the Kampung, it's in Kampung Bubutan. And this is really interesting article from yeah well, many of in the 1930s. Uh, it's uh, about the Museum Bali, <laughs> but the Museum Bali. This article actually addresses the people, especially the young people of Bali. The author of this uh, article provokes why the Balinese people accepted the museumification of their society by the colonial government. The author believes that this policy will help the United Indonesian people because they defends their uh, distinct cultural uh, differences. And another in interesting thing from uh, this uh, publication, this is also editorial note of this newspaper, uh, promoted the messianic belief, the Heru Chokro or Ratu Adil, which is associated with the prophecy of a Japanese king called Joyo Boyo, Arjaya Baya. According to the editor, the prophecy would not be limited only to Java, but to entire Indonesia. This for me, it is very clear to see how the editor treated Java reciprocally with Indonesia, or the, how the Indonesia appropriate the, the tradition of Java. And the, uh, the last uh, news I think is really interesting is about uh, bukti di antara kita sendiri, is a evidence from uh, ourselves that uh, this news uh, contain that uh, JK Lengkong, a people from Minahasa, even he is uh, active in the Minahasa club rather than to another club, is nominated to represent the Indonesian study club at Hementerat. Hementerat is a kind of legislative body in at the, the, the municipality, the Surabaya municipality. Instead of nominated a Yavanese, uh, the club proposed Lengkong as an evidence, the unity of Indonesia. And it's rejected the mainstream idea of the government. I mean, like uh, Colin Trope and so on, the, 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 the people, the minister of colonies, during that period, that the people of East Indies or the Netherlands, East Indies could not be unified due to the various ethnicity, religions, and so on. But yeah, he want to uh, uh, propose uh, this as an evidence. So I am continuing, uh, just a few slides uh, more. It's a Kromo Duto. Kromo Duto, Kromo Duto is the proletar's envoy. 
published once in a week with the Yavanese language, affiliated also with the Indonesia Study Club, especially uh, uh, the division for workers and farmers. However, the editors and publisher, the Imam Supardi, live in Kampung Sulung, so it's not really uh, dominated by the elite. Even yeah, the, uh, most of the, the idea is coming from them. Another in, uh, magazine is this one, Dunia Rakyat, the world of the people. Uh, for this edition, uh, it, uh, we can uh, see that this is temporarily published once in a month. The editorial boards and publisher live in Kampung Kedung Glinder. It's near Jalan Tunjungan, the very famous street of Surabaya right now. And now uh, the other uh, newspaper who published in Kampung Kedung Glinder was this one, the Senjata Indonesia, the weapon of Indonesia to achieve the Indonesian independence based on the justice, truth, and equality. Temporarily published uh, in the weekend, every Saturday. So there is no in this uh, two newspaper or the magazine, even even though there is a really like a, a weapon of Indonesia, but there is no indication that there, there is a fascist, but it's more inclined to the socialist or communist idea rather than the fascist. And the other one is the Tambur, Tamburin, published twice in a month, in the middle of the month, published. Uh, this is also interesting, published by the Unemployment Work Group or the Work Loose Group of Surabaya to achieve fortune soon. Yeah, it is published after the, the, the Malaysia of the, the, the crisis in the 1930. The editor and publisher live in Plambitan. Plambitan is really close to the Kampung Penele. Even its neighborhood, its same neighborhood. <laughs> And uh, it's uh, it's from the nationalist or socialist and communist side, but there is also there was also uh, from the Islamic side, the Voice of Pusura, a monthly magazine published by Pusura. Pusura is one of the biggest organization, Islamic organization in Surabaya. This organization became a member of the Majelis Islam Ala Indonesia of the Indonesian Islamic Assembly in in national level. I mean, not only in Surabaya. And even to uh, despite yeah, his is Islamic orientation, but uh, in uh, one of the, the, the news, uh, Dalam Indonesia, many uh, interesting uh, uh, news that uh, 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 informed by this uh, magazine, yeah, like this one, Sukarno enters as member of Muhammadiyah at Bengkulu. So the orientation not only uh, if they already talk Dalam Indonesia, Indonesia is already, Bengkulu is also become a part of Indonesia. And there is also the former uh, member of Indonesia Study Club, Raden, Mr. Indrechten Raden Ngabe Subroto, appointed as mayor of the Cirebon, of Cirebon. He is the first Indonesian who hold a seat, hold a seat of mayor. So they also um, uh, give a promotion of them. And this is also interesting, it's about the uh, Tentang Bahasa Indonesia. This is a special a special feature on the development of Bahasa Indonesia as a national language, especially after the resolution of Congress Bahasa Indonesia. Actually, this news that uh, really intersecting with my, my, my dissertation project, because it's uh, <laughs> Uh, many of the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the committee of this Congress Bahasa Indonesia is is my <laughs> my focus uh, the, the 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 same figure as my uh, my focus but it's really elite <laughs> and the next one is the uh, yeah this one uh, it's also uh, 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 contain criticism to the youth at the end of the decade the 1930s no one achieve uh, for, for him uh, it's really a saddening news that no one achieved a more prestigious title than high school diploma we're not limited to the kampung people but are widespread in the elite circle of surabaya however the kampung youth had already associated their national aspiration to the bangsa indonesia rather than to other alternative of nation like bangsa jawa or bangsa minahasa like what the youth experienced in previous decade so it's the different uh, orientation of the youth. If in the 1920s, the youth in the 1920s or in the youth in the 1910s, they still have many alternatives of uh, Bangsa, of the nation. But even they, the older generation feel that uh, the, the youth is not really, uh, not really uh, 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 showing the hard work and showing the uh, the the good performance and the good education, but uh, they they still have a uh, uh, benefit or privilege rather uh, uh, if we compare to the youth to other to the previous generation. In the Japanese occupation period, 
This new era provided a new opportunity to the youth. As we see uh, in the, the newspaper, in the Dutch colonial government, only a youth who got better Western education could achieve a better position. In, yeah, like Sukarno, Muhammad Hatta, Dr. Randes, and Dr. Sutomo, seen as a role model for the youth. But in the Japanese occupation era, they could join many new corps. I mean, the military, because the military mobilization, they can join the new corps like PETA, Kyukun, like K. Bodan in Java, and gradually became a new elite. So that's the very different uh, thing. And yeah, I mean, this is a brief remarks of uh, my talk. In, because yeah, in the, the, the this decade, the youth who have communication skills such as Sutomo, this is the, the, the first Sutomo that I address or Buntomo, easily to gain popularity in Kamung people. Because they, uh, if Dr. Sutomo in the previous, uh, the previous decade become a mediator, now the people who had, yeah, have a communication skill and also uh, join the military forces also gain the popularity in Kamung people or even the scout. Uh, Scott organization. By the end of the Japanese occupation, a large proportion of Surabaya youth had some exposure to Japanese methods of drilling and discipline. Many of Indonesian army and military leaders who involved in the revolution of in the Battle of Surabaya came also from Kampung, like Sungkono, who was also the, 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 the commander of the Indonesian army, and even Sumarsono from Pemuda Socialist Indonesia or the Social Indonesian Socialist Youth. Uh, both of them came from Kampung Penele. And I think, yeah, that's all I want to talk. And this is also really interesting. Is it, after independence, oh, uh, I got it from uh, a newspaper, uh, Harian Rakyat uh, of Communist Party. But actually, uh, many Kampung people still believe this, uh, this event. Uh, if they talk, if I, uh, I ask them uh, what event you remember about Sukarno in Surabaya or even in, in the campo, he thought that Sukarno uh, often uh, invited or accompanied uh, uh, people or the leader from outside, from abroad, like whom we is talk is from Viet Cong <laughs> or so Viet Cong. So I think it's, uh, they refer to this, to Ho Chi Minh City in Surabaya. The Ho Chi Minh City actually yeah, uh, uh, visited Surabaya when he invited by Sukarno to Indonesia. Thank you very much uh, and looking forward to having a discussion to all of you. Thanks, Paul.